when I'm talking to young people, I tell them again, it's never been easier to reach out to a mentor because technology is crazy and DMs are awesome and everyone's email is public. Like there's, there's no excuse not to reach out, but I completely understand the fear gap. Cause I remember being 18 years old and looking up to someone and saying like, man, I, I'd really love to have a coffee with them, but man, they would never want to meet with me. And just feeling like I don't, I don't bring anything to the conversation. Um, and I, I just love talking to young people and saying mentorship is like, just like you said, it will save you so much heartache, but it's also an accelerator to push you way faster forward than you would have if you just waited. It was John Wesley who called families the seminaries of godliness. Mm -hmm. And as families have become disintegrated and just the collapse of the, the Christian families. We're seeing like even as the theme of delayed adolescence is taking place as some people in the generation are getting married later, moving out of mom and dad's house later, stepping in their career later. We're talking like late 20s, maybe early 30s. And we've just come across a statistic saying that 85% of life's biggest decisions are made between your 18th and 35th birthday. Any more thoughts on that? Oh, 100%. Uh, let me just say quickly, like women of God are awesome. They are stepping up to the plate. I'm seeing it over you. And honestly, I'll tell guys this, like publicly and in person, like the women are taking over in the best way possible. What's up, fam? It's Josiah. This is the Young Adults Today podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching on YouTube. And today is a conversation where we dive in deep about discipleship pathways for young adults with our friend Augustine Mendoza. He serves at ORU, Oral Roberts University. And man, we unpack what is discipleship? How is it different from mentorship or just leadership? And so if you are a parent, a pastor, a caring adult, somebody who's leading a young adult ministry or cares about the faith of the next generation. This conversation is all about the discipleship of Gen Z on college campuses, in young adult ministries, in local churches and communities across America, across the globe. And Thanksgiving is just around the corner. Mike and I want to take a second just to say we're grateful for you, every viewer, every listener on the Young Adults Today podcast. And look, this podcast and our ministry, which has recently resources and events, events like camps for young adults, conferences for leaders, and we're just getting started. We have a vision of reaching 10,000 young adults for Christ, equipping thousands of leaders to do the same in their churches, in their communities. Would you consider a year-end gift to the ministry of young adults today? Look, it's not possible to do what God's asked us to do without the generosity of our friends, our families, churches, businesses, and viewers like you. We're so grateful. We're excited. We believe the best is yet to come. And our conversation about discipling Gen Z starts now. What's up, guys? Hope you're feeling alive right now. I'm Micah Keneally. I'm Josiah Keneally. This is the Young Adults Today podcast. Today, we're talking mentoring and discipleship of Gen Z with Augustine Mendoza. Man, what's up? How are you? Come on. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Stoked to be here. Uh, love your podcast. Shout out to your podcast. Uh, love what you guys are doing. So thanks for having me on. It's an honor, man. Thanks for joining us. And the question, if you listen or watch... Usually the place we start, um, we'll get into your story in a second, but Augustine, why is young adult ministry so vital? We ask every guest to start with that. Great question. Definitely prepared for this one because to me, like the young adult season of life is one of the most vital seasons of a person's life. I'm sure for you guys, for many of the listeners, for me too, that 18 to 22 to 25 year old range is really key in making big decisions. So when we talk about what's vital, uh, we're talking about decisions that will impact the rest of their life. Maybe what they're studying in school, internships, gap year relationships. Do I date her? Do I not date her? Do I ask her out? Do I not ask her out? Do I marry this girl? Like big decisions that I remember having to make that um, I think it's so important that resources like you guys offer, um, but also things that you know we all do in conversation, in ministry, in churches, um, is really important for this age group. So why is it vital? Because we're making a lot of big, vital decisions during that time. So that would be my answer. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. I don't think you could be even more right. And we're seeing like, even as the theme of delayed adolescence is taking place, as some people in the generation are getting married later, moving out of mom and dad's house later, stepping in their career later, we're talking like 
late twenties, maybe early thirties. And we've just come across a statistic saying that 85% of life's biggest decisions are made between your 18th and 35th birthday. And as we see delayed adolescence, that 35 number might change throughout the years of like, Mm -hmm. maybe it's in the 40, maybe it goes down to 30. We just don't know all the trends and the fads and just the desires of the heart and how every generation kind of just does life a little different because they've seen what they don't want and which causes them to know what they do want. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they are up against a lot of crazy questions and um, they're seeking answers. And we know before we hit record, we heard a little bit about your story, but for the audience who doesn't know who you are, where you've come from, what you've been up to, would you catch us up today? Yeah, I'll catch you up on my story. Here it is. I uh, was actually born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, but moved to Colorado Springs when I was really young. And then basically had my whole entire childhood in Colorado Springs, had a great family, great church, great foundation of my faith. And uh, when I came to college, I went to Oral Roberts University um, at 18. uh, And long story of how I got there, but basically just got really divinely kind of pointed, this is the way I want you to go. So glad I said yes to that because it's been one of the best decisions of my life that has changed the entire trajectory of what I thought my life was going to look like to what it actually is now. Um, So much better than I could have planned. But I studied um, theology um, in my undergraduate years, um, graduated at 22. Um, I met my wife while studying at ORU, um, got a degree, got a ring, as as I like to say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we really started that ministry life together after we graduated. So kind of complex where she worked for an organization called Voice of the Martyrs. I was a youth pastor um, in Colorado Springs at uh, New Life Church, but Uh eventually ended up at uh, ORU, both on staff. Um, Super long, crazy story, but God has positioned us now to be able to work on staff together for eight years at ORU um, and do different things. My wife gets to oversee our missions and outreach program here, sending literally hundreds of students around our city and around the globe just to get missional engagement and experience. And I get to work on the discipleship side, everything from podcasts to events, to small groups, to retreats, and even some new stuff that we're cooking up. So I'm, I'm really excited for this season, uh, because I love young adults and I love what they get to do. So that's a little snapshot into, into my life. I love it. And I have, I have a follow-up question. So a lot of our listeners, they're probably young adults, they're going to school for ministry, they're in seminary, they're passionate about reaching their generation, but many of them want to do it with a spouse. What encouragement would you have right out of the gate of saying, like you said eight years doing ministry, yeah. kind of underneath different branches, but you're sure. still linking arms. Mm-hmm. What has worked for you in the calling of ministry as husband and wife? And how would you encourage a listener who finds himself in a season of, wow, I I'm sick of doing ministry alone, or I want to do it with my spouse, but maybe they're just not there yet. Yeah, it's great. I would probably answer in, in two parts. First part is you have to resolve in your heart where your priorities are. And so for me growing up, I always knew like, hey, I, I really want to be married. I'm really excited about that day. And to me, it's going to be Jesus, my marriage, and then my ministry. And it mm-hmm. has to stay in that order. If they get out of order, um, I think that's where idolatry happens. Um, or you start making decisions with the wrong motives, um, or you neglect in a really important part of that. And so I really see my relationship with Jesus overflowing into my marriage. And then for someone that wants to do marriage and ministry together, I think it can be really tricky. I'm sure you guys have seen this a little bit with the stuff that you guys do. If you're not careful, your marriage is only about ministry and you forget that the first ministry is to each other. Yep. And so I think keeping those priorities intact because I want to be married when I'm 80 and I want our marriage to be even stronger then than it is now. Um, But the only way that happens is if we keep those priorities in order. So I think if you're a young person listening to this, if your priorities aren't in order, you're going to go and seek things out of order and then try to put them in order later. And it's really hard and messy. So don't do that. Jesus, your spouse, and then ministry. And so the second part of that, like on a more practical note, I think is you want to find someone who can run at the same pace as you. Um, Because I think a lot of people are called to ministry in different capacities, um, whether it be vocational or maybe in a a different setting. Um, For me, I just knew me and my wife or my future wife when I was looking for a wife (laughs) was someone that I was like, we're going to run really hard, really fast. I want someone who can go global with me. I want to do someone that's like um, up for an adventure. Um, And I think every person's built different. So if there was an amazing woman of God that I saw, she's awesome. She's incredible, but she doesn't fit 
that kind of molded what I'm thinking. That's okay. Like that's, that's not the woman for me. I can champion her, celebrate her, encourage her as a friend, but like, that's not the person I'm called to run with. And so when I met my wife, there were just so many things where she was better than me at, honestly, like she challenged me to grow. Um, but also there were things that when we came together, we didn't complete each other. We complimented one another. Okay. So she made me better. I made her better. And we just kept pushing each other more and more to become more like Jesus and to pursue Jesus at that same pace. And so I, I told a student the other day, I said, like, so many people talk about the unequally yoked aspect. And they talk about like the believer and the non-believer, which is true. And that's a whole nother conversation. But I think sometimes we don't look at it as like, does that person love Jesus just as much as me? Do they run just as hard as me? Do they make me want to run faster and harder after Jesus than I am now? And I think that's what more Christian young adults should think about is like, do they inspire you to pursue the things of God more? And so that would be my advice for, I think, a young person looking at marriage and ministry and that and that combo. That's Absolutely. Great. And I'm just looking, Augustine, right behind you. Is that two degrees that I see from ORU? <laughs> yeah. Both of them, my undergrad and my master's. Yeah. What, what were they in? My undergrad was in a degree called ministry and leadership, where yep. they teach you practical leadership skills, theology, Bible, ministry methodology, and kind of put it all in one degree. Super fun. And then my master's was in practical theology, kind of more of a deep dive into uh, Bible and theology. Um so really good, like foundational and deepening of my walk with Jesus and in what I do in ministry every day. So it's awesome. For sure. So cool. That's so it. good. Um, man, yeah. when we, uh, I, I, you said one thing about ORU is like, you said something to the effect of like, you were so glad that you went there. And um, part of how Micah and I met is through North Central University. Mm -hmm. That's where I did my undergrad. I thought I was done with the bachelor's degree. I thought I was one of those that I thought it was plenty, but then they launched a grad school program and I was still single at the time. I was like, there's no better time. And the first class I got a full scholarship on 50% on the second class. And I think everything else was 25% off. And wow. It was just an amazing opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I felt this three consecutive times. First day of chapel as an undergrad, I signed up late. I was going to go somewhere else for business, felt a call to ministry in August of 2010. And so switched to North Central, had never toured, had never done anything like that, but showed up. Wow. And first day of chapel just felt the sense you're exactly where you belong. Mm -hmm. Then um, I guess it might be four times I felt this on the last day of chapel undergrad, they awarded me the Israel trip. And so I got to go study abroad with grad school for a month in the Holy Lands. Then I, I ended up back for grad school. That was mm -hmm. an amazing experience. And then now, believe it or not, six, seven years, I've taught adjunct um, cool. one, one or two classes a semester. And so, man, I'm with you that just like... <laughs> There's something electric that I light up on the college campus because the the potential is palpable. You can, I don't know about you, but I can sense that there could be a next great awakening that these young, bright minds are going to go further and faster mm -hmm. and Lord willing, stand on our shoulders and just talking for spiritual life for a second of young adults. We'll, we'll talk in a few minutes about mentoring and discipleship, but what trends are you seeing when it comes to the spiritual lives of young adults at ORU? It's a great question. Yeah. It's an exciting time to be on college campuses. I think we can look at a lot of different movements, um, churches, networks, um, whether they be Christian schools or not Christian schools, like God's doing something on university campuses in the U S and it's cool to see the hunger from students for just the authentic. And so if I was to describe the overall vibe of ORU and the spiritual hunger, it would just be like a desire for the authentic. Uh, nothing wrong with, you know, fancy stuff, cool events, lights, sound, great videos. I think those are all super fun and young people love them. But there's something different about an authentic encounter, authentic yeah. relationships, uh, authentic community. Um, really having an understanding of like, we're just really going after Jesus. All this other stuff is great. And we need a lot of the other stuff, but to really focus on Jesus, make sure that the main thing stays the main thing. 
And I think here at ORU and really all these college campuses, we're seeing God do stuff. It's starting because people are just saying, we want the real thing in the midst of a lot of noise and, and political chaos and cultural confusion and gender stereotypes and racism in the midst of all that, man, we just need something real. We need something authentic. And then from there, yeah, let's build on that foundation of Jesus. So God's doing awesome stuff at ORU, man. We're seeing God just like move in really powerful encounter ways, like in our chapel uh, services, in our, in our prayer room. But we're also seeing students get ignited to go and to lead and to serve and to like be engaged with what God's doing in the world and not just stay in our, our four walls and say everything's great here, but to say we want to take it to our city, to the nations, um, and internships and jobs. Like the stories I hear every day are just incredible. And it's not because of me or because of any one person. It's because people are just being obedient to the basics of what we see in Acts and basics of what we see of being a follower of Jesus looks like is just doing the basics. And I think if if young adults just went back to the basics and asked themselves, am I doing the basics of Christianity? I feel like it would be a total game changer for, for our society. That's so true. We just got back from Tennessee a couple of days ago and we were at a children's discipleship forum and it was through Awana and they were talking about the importance mm -hmm. of discipleship and what that is and what that looks like. And a new statistic came out finding that you have a 3% chance of saying yes to Jesus after your 30th birthday. Wow. So for example, if there are 55 million young adults in the U.S. right now, 1.65 have the opportunity of saying yes to Jesus after their 30th birthday. Mm. So it's just like, so we have 50, little over 53 point whatever percent have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus before their 30th birthday because of their worldview, discipleship, mentorship, um, career, like whatever trajectory they're on right now, like where's God going to intersect them? And we, Josiah and I, we really strongly believe in mentorship and discipleship. And many churches, at least in our area, say discipleship is a pillar and a foundational principle yep. that they have within their walls. But uh, I will be so boldly to say, what are you using? Where is it at? What is your, what do you, how do you describe discipleship? Is it going to church, taking notes, going home, being plugged into a small group? Like, is that if that's our working definition, then maybe we should go back to the basics, like you said, and really understand like what is that one on one, what is that life on life community communion, um, breaking of bread like around the table, supporting of sports and athletic uh, athletic games and everything. So, I'd be curious to see. Um, I mean, you're in it every single day. What what is your working definition, or how have you unpacked? your approach when it comes to mentoring and discipling Gen Z specifically? The loaded question. My gosh, we could talk for <laughs> hours on that. Um, I, I would say to, to boil it down, discipleship is following the way of Jesus. And that may sound oversimplistic, but I think, again, I think this generation is looking for the simple basics. Um, I, I look at, you know, biblical literacy for a generation that, Honestly, and I, I go at our students sometimes about this is like, you have no excuse to not read the word. Like if there was any excuse in generations past, for sure, I didn't have access. Um, only certain people have Bibles. Bibles weren't in written form. Like I, there's a lot of excuses for past generations, but for current generation, if you have one of these, you have no excuse. I mean, you just have no excuse. So I think when you talk about discipleship, you're really saying, let's go back to the basics and the basics of following Jesus are a lot of things you can describe. Like we're talking about breaking bread. We're talking about engaging community. We're talking about worship. We're talking about prayer and fasting and all the basics that when you read the life of Jesus, the things he talks about, if you went through and said, here's all the things that Jesus said, how many of those things am I doing on a regular basis? This is what discipleship looks like. I think the problem with America in general is we're a very, um, consumeristic society, very individualistic. And so we all feel like we need to have a program that caters to us. When we look at the early times where Jesus was living, it was everything revolves around the teacher. The teacher doesn't revolve around the life of the student. And so the, the, the student would follow the rabbi everywhere, would follow everything that he does, he says, he would write it down, he would eat meals with them, he would sleep in the same place as them. Like it was a life after the master, after the rabbi. And I think there's a desire from Gen Z to have that kind of life, 
but not a lot of people show them what it means to have that kind of life. Instead, they give them like models or programs. And I'm not against models and programs. We have models and programs here at ORU that I think are really helpful. But I think the question to ask is, is discipleship measured by outcomes or outputs? Because mm, outputs good. are what the church is really good at. Like we can measure how many people went to discipleship group A or how many people came to service B um, or how many people our pastor met with in a month and say like, that's our discipleship outputs. But the discipleship outcomes are things that you can't measure necessarily numerically, but saying, hey, hey, let's track the growth, the maturity and the development of the Christ follower over time. And I think that's where we're headed. I, I, I pray that's where we're headed as the American church to basically say, how many people came to service? It's somewhat important. But what's really important is saying, OK, look at all of the single moms in our congregation and say, hey, how are they being engaged? And, and, and it's a bigger question. It's a harder question. It's it's more difficult to look at that because you can't just say, yes, they've all been talked to about Jesus. They all received a Bible or something we can check a box to. But in my experience, if you want a, a very Gen Z response, there's no checkbox for discipleship. You can't just say, check, check, check. I'm a good disciple. It's an engagement of life. And so what we do at ORU is we try to provide a variety of outlets that allow a student to actively choose any of these different outlets that lead to outcomes, not necessarily outputs. Sure, we have data and things we can track and attendance and engagement, but my focus and my team's focus is way more outcome-based than it is output-based. So we can get a lot of specifics if you want, but that's kind of like a good overall view of kind of how I see discipleship for Gen Z. That's so good. Well, what I hear you describing is kind of like we're really good many times um, just in life at quantitative analysis, mm -hmm. attendance, giving, et cetera, you know, water baptism. Um, and some of these are great things, yep. um, child dedication, but there's, there is more of a, a quanti a, a qualitative, like how, how is somebody maturing in Christ? Where is the growth curve? Where, what trajectory are they on? Are they in a growing, dynamic, mm -hmm. developing relationship with Jesus? Yep. And um, gosh, I think that follow-up things are like, are there caring adults in a teenager or young adult's life? Is there a contagious community that they're a part of? Mm -hmm. Are they experiencing loneliness i mean is is there healing all kinds of things that mm -hmm. if you really can do a, a deep dive obviously would you say that for a young adult pastor or a board or a parent or a church leader listening would you encourage them to have some sort of ongoing surveys um to kind of gauge like hey at the beginning of 2025 we're going to pass out in small groups or on Sundays or a combination of both and try to get uh, an assessment of where people are. And then maybe mid-year or the end of the year, we're going to kind of track once again, what, what would some of your practical maybe next steps be on, on a layer of discipleship? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's actually something I'm working on right now for our students that I think there's there's churches and, and movements that do this as well, but I'm trying to tailor a little bit to our audience, but I would recommend evaluations that you could do for yourself. I think, you know, you look at personality tests or, or leadership evaluations of yourself. They're so popular right now. Like everyone loves to do them. Everyone knows, loves to know their Enneagram or their working genius, Myers-Briggs. So I think people love doing self-assessment. So yeah. I think that's a big option, uh, a win for the church right now is like, yo, let's capitalize on that. But not doing it from the place of let me make a label for you or give you a rating on a one to 10, but again, making them outcome based to say, okay, let, let's take uh, biblical engagement, for example. Um, if, if a church or something I'm working on here at ORU says, hey, I want to know how biblically immersed our young people are. And so I'm going to create an evaluation tool for them. Really simple, really practical, not like an academic survey of 200 questions. I mean, like really simple that gives them and me. So the, the audience I'm polling and my and myself as the polar to say, hey, like, let me see what our biblical engagement rate is at ORU. And let me look at it from the perspective of not 
do you read a chapter of the Bible every day? Because that would be very output based, but outcome based would be like, would you say that you are biblically engaged and really match that with data nationally? Um, and so one thing I'm working on right now is looking at different areas of discipleship. So biblical engagement would be one of them to, to really say it, at, from a student's perspective, do they see themselves as biblically engaged? Because sometimes they may say, yeah, I'm biblically engaged. I read the verse of the day every day. The Bible app tells me. So I read the word every day. Other people would say, no, I'm not. Like, I really want to be. Great. What would be helpful for you in biblical engagement? And they're telling me how I can create tools to help them grow in discipleship in the area of biblical engagement. And it's not that hard to do, like with our, our technology and our tools. The problem I think a lot of people run into, and even I, I feel at ORU when I'm doing it for students sometimes, is their responses is, one, going to give me honest feedback about me and my team to say, <laughs> we're not really hitting the mark. And we have to be honest and look ourselves in the mirror and say, man, all that stuff that we're doing, it doesn't matter because they're, they're not reading the word. Even though we're doing all these good things, it's not actually helping them grow biblically because they told me so. So that that's a hard pill to swallow. But the second part is then it creates work, right? Because if I say, hey, this is what they're saying they want, we have to create it. We have to do it. This is our responsibility to engage them biblically and give them these outlets or opportunities. And so I think evaluation tools can be really helpful. And that's something we're working on at ORU um, from freshman to senior, looking at it from ages, uh, majors. And so we can even break down like, yo, theology majors are really engaged, but business majors, no. So we need to create something for our business majors so they see the value of reading the word of God mm -hmm. because they're coming at it from a different angle. Maybe a theology student's like, yeah, I should know the word of God. So they read it a lot. But maybe a business major is like the verse of the day is good enough for them. So how do I cultivate hunger for the word of God in a student that's about to go spend the next 40 years of life in business? Yeah. Um, so those are the kind of questions I'm asking and trying to create evaluations and opportunities for students on the other side of that. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, it was John Wesley who called families, the seminaries of godliness. Mm -hmm. And as families have become disintegrated and just the collapse of the, the Christian families in our culture, it's really, um, you know, I think a lot of pastors and church leaders would understand this, that they would say of kids and of children and of youth and teenagers, mm -hmm. like, well, a parent is the primary disciple maker or the responsible for the primary discipleship of their kid. And a church would be like a supplement. Maybe there's an hour or two or three. Mm -hmm. And we were just like Micah mentioned at the child discipleship forum. So I think we're really, um, of, of course, passionate. But I think just really evaluating how is it all working and mm -hmm. are we satisfied mm -hmm. with where discipleship is, is happening? We heard from a number of the top curriculum developers for next gen curriculum. And what they found is that they, there's been a, a pendulum that swung from the church programming to the family side. And it's mm -hmm. like all these curriculums, whether it's parent Q or orange or, gosh, any of them, group publishing, any of them, what they're really trying to emphasize is, hey, there's going to be this Wednesday night programming. There's going to be this Sunday school or, or church for, for youth students and for kids. But what they found is that 10 to 15% of the families utilize the at-home portion of those curriculum. Mm. If they hit 15, like the Bible and, and Curriculum publishers are thrilled. They said they're doing cartwheels if they if they hit like 15% of the families are participating. But a, a, a seminary prof got up and shared that she was like, those 15% of parents and families would be doing something anyway. Mm. And so I'm fascinated by all this. One of our friends, Grant Skeldon, he describes um, discipleship being come and follow me, mm -hmm. mentoring to be come and meet with me. But where maybe we are is as pastors and leaders, come and listen to me, come mm -hmm. and attend. And so I, I hope that we can kind of provoke people to affection in Christ and to action and um, drilling into discipleship. We, we did that on, on the topic of mentorship. 
I know in my own life, caring adults, whether it was a youth pastor, an older mentor in my life, sometimes a 30 minutes spent with a mentor has saved me like three years of heartbreak and headaches. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on, on mentorship? Absolutely necessary, especially for Gen Z. And there's a great fear gap between a, maybe a Gen Z young adult and a mentor that uh, I've tried to dispel a lot at ORU. When I'm talking to young people, I tell them again, it's never been easier to reach out to a mentor because technology is crazy and DMs are awesome and everyone's email is public. Like there's, there's no excuse not to reach out, but I completely understand the fear gap. Cause I remember being 18 years old and looking up to someone and saying like, man, I, I'd really love to have a coffee with them, but man, they would never want to meet with me. And just feeling like I don't, I don't bring anything to the conversation. Um, and I, I just love talking to young people and saying mentorship is like, just like you said, it will save you so much heartache, but it's also an accelerator to push you way faster forward than you would have if you just waited. So if you just try to figure it on your own, you'll figure it out eventually. But I loved being able to kickstart or jumpstart a lot of areas of my life when it comes to mentorship. And so what I advise students to do, and I think this has helped a lot of them, is first of all, debunk the myth that the mentor is like this sage know-all person that's going to know how to do everything. Instead, look at a person and say, look at one thing, one thing in their life that you love. And you say, man, if I could have even a marriage a little bit like that, a ministry a little bit like that, uh, a public speaking gift a little bit like that, um, financial wisdom a little bit like that. If I had just a little bit of that, I would be so much better as a person, as a leader. Um, and so I would say, find the person, find that one little thing that you really want to know about and drill down on that, like go hard on that one thing, instead of saying, who is the person that will give me the wisdom in every area of my life? Because it's a really tall order to, to for, for a mentor to live up to, yeah. but also it's not calculated. It's not strategic. You're not going to be able to actually grow in anything because you're going to hit like 20 topics. I tell young people, find one person for one thing and just reach out and ask, say, I just really want to ask you about one area. It's this area. And I've done that so many times over my life about different areas. And I'm so much better than I would have been if I didn't learn to stand on the shoulders of other people that knew better than me, that knew more than me. And I've just seen with young people when they catch that, that like they reach out one time to one person, it goes well. And then they're like, I'm going to do this like five more times in five other topics. And all of a sudden they got like 10 mentors. And so I think it's debunking this myth of the person who knows everything and I have to meet with them about everything. Um, so it's a lot less pressure. But two, it's also, it relieves the pressure of saying a mentor's for life. And so I don't know about you guys, but I've seen this with young people. I've seen them out in life. Most mentors aren't for life. The majority of mentors in your life are for a season. There's a select few that may be with you for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. But in general, most of my mentors have been seasonal. So I would ask a mentor to coffee to help me figure out finances when I got married when I was younger and like trying to figure out how to do this well. How do I set my marriage up well with finances? just as a practical example. And I would meet with him maybe once or twice, three times in the first year of my marriage. And I haven't met with him since, but we're still friends. We have a relationship. And I know I can go to him if I ever had that, that question about anything going on. But I met with him in that season. It was really good. It was helpful. We have a long-term relationship, but he's not actively meeting with me every week or every month. Um, but then there's other people in my life, man, I talk to at least once a month and I'm getting wisdom from them all the time. So for young people to also know mentorship doesn't have to be this person that you meet with every week or every month. It can be seasonal as well and say, what do I need to glean from this person this season and really grow myself? And then, yeah, God's going to carry me into a new season with new people and new things. So mentorship is awesome. And I think anyone that jumps on that ship, man, you're going to grow so much faster than if you just try to figure it out by yourself. I love it. I love that you went there because one thing that we talk to young adults, obviously all the time, I'd say nine out of 10 will say, I do not have a mentor and I'm looking for one, but I don't know how to ask. Yep. And that's one thing that we touch on right away is find one thing you admire about that individual. And you're giving them permission to speak into that one area of your life for, for yep. whatever season it is three months, two years, 10 sessions, whatever it is. Because I think as mentors, I think we can put pressure on ourselves or we put pressure 
or we could put pressure on our mentors. And there's two things that I say to every single per- girl that I mentor or disciple or come alongside right out of the shoot. I say, number one, I want you to know something like I am not God and I'm not the Holy Spirit. So mm-hmm. whatever pedestal you put me on or however you think I am in this area that you want me to speak into, know that I'm not perfect. I am not God. I have a relationship with, with him. I feel like the Holy Spirit's going to speak to me and challenge you in ways. Um, but to encourage a young adult never to give one person full permission to speak into every area of your life. Because I think that is a dangerous, slippery slope to be in. And I think Josiah has actually experienced that where a young man's like, just tell me what to do. Tell me what to go to school for. I'll just do it. And yep. Josiah's like, I can't do that. And I advise you never to say that to anybody because you're going to tell it to the wrong person and end up living somebody else's life and be disappointed with the life that you chose to live in somebody else's shoes. So, well, and to just jump in for a second is this a few, this was a few years ago. We were actually campus missionaries on a college campus. And I noticed that every one-on-one that I had, there was like, six, maybe seven tough topics that young adults were really wrestling with their faith. Mm -hmm. And so one of my favorite college uh, professors has his doctorate. He's a, he's legitimately a theologian. And so I was like, Hey, can I buy you lunch? And I have six questions Mm -hmm. and I just need some of your library. I need some of your insight on when a young adult asks these six questions, What's my framework? Because I was at a point where I had my master's degree, but I'm like, do I need more education? Do I need a doctorate degree? And you know what? One lunch with Dr. Tennyson, Mm -hmm. I found six books to read on those six topics. Mm -hmm. And I felt so much more prepared to have some of the conversations that people really wanted to ask. And I didn't have all the answers. But it just gave me mm-hmm. a fluency to to see a couple different perspectives, a couple of different worldviews, and to go, you know what? Let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that that's huge, yeah. um, huge. That when when what you're saying is to find like maybe to say it this way, find the pain point in your life. And maybe it is money. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're like, I grew up in a family. We never talked about money. I went to school, never took a budgeting class, went to church and they don't really talk about money either. If it's it's finances, Mm -hmm. is there a financial advisor or a wealth manager, somebody that you see is really generous that you're like, man, it seems like maybe they don't have everything together, but they know what they're talking about. We have some good godly principles. Exactly. And some experience. Fruit, fruit in their life. That's the second thing I'd say. Aside from what area you would value, what fruit is in their life? Because yes. if there's fruit, they're doing something right. Something's flourishing. And speaking of fruit, our our prayer for the next generation is that they are fruitful, that wow. they do walk in cadence with Christ and they do discover and uncover everything he has for them versus the things that the world has to offer. So when it comes to your hope, um, Augustine, when it comes to the hope as it relates to the next generation, what is one thing that you're like, if this next generation can have anything, what are you hoping for them? Hmm. My hope for the next generation is that they radically fall in love with and represent the person of Jesus. And I, I'm tempted to say 10 things that I can think about that I'd love to as well. But I think that going back to the basics is kind of my, my core charge at ORU with young people is just like, look, there's 10 things that I love, 10 different causes, 10 different aspects, 10 different theological conversations we can have, um, ways to impact culture and politics. But at the end of the day, I hope this generation truly and authentically loves the person of Jesus and out of the overflow of that love for him um, represents him in every career path and every relationship, every marriage that will be represented from every student that goes from over you or around the U S is uh, to me, it's that's the greatest call. And again, so many great things that our churches are doing, our ministries are doing, but to keep the main thing, the main thing and build around that instead of making it one of the 10 things, if that makes sense. Yes. And I love that you ta- like take that second thing on there with represents him well, because I think we're running into a lot of Gen Zers who are like, yeah, I've seen Christianity. And it's like, oh, if you've seen the right version of Christ through a Christian, you'd be, you'd be drawn to it. Not like, eek, like this is not yeah. for me, you know? So to, to those two things, things together, I think is essential. Yes. <laughs> what about this, man? If there was like one or two 
frequently asked questions or if if they're like what what are one or two of the conversations that you're having every day on the college campus relationships is that one can we guess <laughs> should we guess <laughs> mm. you know i honestly not relationships because i think it's a whole nother side conversation but i think gen z is terrified of relationships even more so than millennials which is my generation wow. like wow I think there, uh, there's a lot of factors to that. So we, I won't go into it because I'll talk about it for 20 minutes. But I think the top two conversations I have, especially with young men on campus, um, is one, how to at, like have a vibrant relationship with Jesus. I talk to a lot of Christians on campus who grew up in the church, been around the church, been around Christian things, but pretty apathetic or dull in their faith. So I'm having a lot of conversations around that topic. And then I'm having a lot of conversations with men about pornography, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. It is, it's crazy how common it is statistically, but it's a, it's a part of my story. And so I've been pretty open and public about it at ORU and talking to guys about it from stages, one-on-ones and coffee and all that. And so many times I hear, I've never talked to someone who's opened up about it. Like maybe they've heard a speaker, like at a conference or something really big, but never had the open door conversation with someone who's been public about it. And so just a lot of conversations about sexual integrity and how to be a man that lives that way in a crazy digital world where you can't get away from a lot of stuff. Like how do you, how do you keep your heart pure? Um, and then also having the conversations about, you know, being a man of God that loves Jesus when it can be kind of weird sometimes in different cultures and vibes of like, not a feely guy, but how do I love Jesus? Like authentically, but not feel like I'm crying in services. And if I don't cry, it's okay. You know, kind of the emotionalism mm -hmm. with spiritual growth. So I think those two buckets are my, my big conversation points. It's powerful. And they're both necessary, completely necessary. Yeah. That's so good. Thank you for doing that and speaking integrity into their life while yeah, pointing them to sense. Christ in the process. You know, I've been, um, really fired up Augustine about a couple of things. One is there's an atheist named Scott Galloway. He was an NYU college professor, had 5,500 college students that he taught. Wow. And he's an atheist, um, S Scott Galloway or Prof G. And I heard him in an interview on a podcast I listened to. And he said that by any metric, no demographic or group of people had fallen further, faster, harder than young men. Mm. And that really troubled me. And it, it still rattles me. And then he went on to say that we need more religious institutions, churches, church programming. And this is an atheist singing our song, if you will. And I just think he's so dead on the money. And I look at the rise of like a prominent figure like him, also Jordan Peterson, kind of this academic father figure in a generation of fatherless young men mm -hmm. and people are really responding, even like um, Joe Rogan or other kind of alpha personalities, mm -hmm. men. Um, yep. And some are drawn in the business sphere to like an Elon Musk or, you know, uh, but I think young men are really trying to figure out life. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, it's not that young women aren't, but I just think that there, there seems to be a lot more flourishing in the lives of, of young ladies mm -hmm. and culturally just, um, wow, a troubled current circumstances and, and patterns with young men. Any more thoughts on that? Oh, hundred percent. Uh, let me just say quickly, like women of God are awesome. They are yeah. stepping up to the plate. I'm seeing it over you. And honestly, I'll tell guys this like publicly and in person, like, the women are taking over in the best way possible. Like they're stepping up to the plate because they're ready. They're hungry. They're eager. They're not distracted. Like when you get a woman who really loves Jesus, she's stepping into this new level of boldness that I'm like, it's crazy guys. <laughs> they're like, they're cool with being cool. They're cool with being casual. They're cool with like, you know, I'm not going to compromise and be too passionate about Jesus and like lose this bit of like vibe that I've got here. Um, so it's a bit of pride that I don't think as many women, women deal with on a regular basis. Obviously there's exceptions. So this is very generalistic speaking, mm -hmm. but like when I'm talking to like people on this campus and I'm saying, here's something we're doing, here's a leadership opportunity. Who wants to be a part of this? Eight women raise their hand to two guys, you know, like the 80% of women are like all in. And then there's like these 20% of guys that are like, 
super hungry, super passionate, all on fire. And then there's every other guy. Not saying they're bad dudes or they're living wrong. They're just, you know, like, yeah, it's, I mean, it sounds cool and everything. Is it apathy? It's, I think it's a bit of apathy, but also I think they're looking for a strong male figure. Mm -hmm. And so I've even had to wrestle with that personally of like, you know, how much of this do I have to take on or like change how I lead or how I speak to men? Because I've even seen um, the guys that you mentioned, but let's throw in some other crazy names. Uh, not necessarily endorsements, just guys that I know. Totally. See, guys are listening to guys like Trump. Okay. Yep. Guys like, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Tate. Yeah. Andrew um, Tate. I was wondering if you were going to bring him Tate. up. I, yep. I got told this other day, there's, there's a, not at or either. There's another guy, Christian Gen Z, 20 year old. And he, and I was asking about what comes doing in his life. And he quoted Andrew Tate as like a, an inner motivation of how he was pursuing Jesus. Like didn't bring up scripture or a preacher, a podcaster. Mm -hmm. You brought up Andrew Tate. And I just remember looking at him. Like, Are you serious right now? Like you just quoted Andrew Tate as a part of like your spiritual growth mentality of like how you're going to pursue Jesus. And it's just, I think what you hit was spot on. Guys are looking for strong men. Mm -hmm. We could say alpha yep. personalities. Uh, so many guys like Elon Musk, they're like, I love how he just says what he says. And I think honestly, it's an invitation for the church yeah. to get off of this politically correct PC language of like, I'm just trying to like, so when I talk to guys about pornography, like it's, a, I've started doing this. I've seen it be really effective from stages or one-on-one -on -one is I'm mm -hmm. like, yo, if we're going to talk about this, let's say the word. Okay. Mm -hmm. let's, say, let's say the word porn out loud as Christians, because you love like, oh, I just struggle with these bad thoughts or yeah, I have some unhealthy rhythms in my life. Like, what are you saying? Like, mm -hmm. what are you saying? Like, let's call, say, let's call it out. It. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because Look, TikTok has no problem saying what it is. Mm. Twitter X has no problem saying what it is. Like your favorite politician, your favorite influencer, Joe Rogan, they're just going to say it as it is. Yeah. And so Gen Z is looking, especially Gen Z men are looking for men who will say what it is, draw a line in the sand, and then let's do it. The problem with so many, I think pastors and leaders in our generation, like people that we know is they're trying to <laughs> keep everything balanced. And I have deep respect and appreciation for pastors because I know it's not black and white all the time, but I think we need to be more black and white, draw a line in a lot of issues. And it's going to be divisive. It's going to be hard yeah. and it's going to be very uncomfortable. When I, I, I remember short story, I remember talking to some junior high boys and I got asked to go speak to them. It was like 300 of them, um, sixth to eighth grade. And they were like, Hey, like come talk about purity and what you can do in junior high to live as a man of purity. And I was like, absolutely. This sounds awesome. So I prepared my notes in junior high style. It's going to be great. So I show up, you know, 300, 300 of these kids, like that's crazy. So I walk up and, and I kid you not in the green room, 10 minutes before I go up, these three moms, two of them, kids, pastors, one, like a, a youth pastor. Oh, no. Hey, before you go, just want to make sure that you're going to keep everything like PG for these boys. And I was like, PG, like, what does that mean? And they were like, well, you're not going to use like crass words. And I was like, crass words? Like, what are you talking about? Like, can you explain what you mean? Like, well, we just don't want any vocabulary for them to take out of the room that would be inappropriate. And I was like, well, I'm not going to curse. Like, I'm not, I'm not cursing up there, but I'm going to say the word porn. Um, I'm going to say the word masturbation. I'm going to say only fans. I'm going to say things because that's not the first time they've heard those things. Probably. <laughs> right. Well, here's already told them. Yep. So here I'm going to be as a Christian influence talking about the word of God, talking about what Jesus thinks about these things, but I'm going to say them because I need to communicate to them. I know your world and I know that we need to draw a line. So let's just be really clear about our expectations. And these women were a little bit horrified, but it went well and the guys responded well and it was a great conversations afterwards. But I just think as a Christian culture, we need to just say it as it is, not for the sake of getting a viral tweet or going viral on Instagram and TikTok because I said something super crazy. Um, it's simply saying like, there's truth and we need to draw a line and say, yo, if you struggle with porn, I want to help you. And like have that line instead of saying, if you just, you know, have struggles, just talk to the Lord about it. That's not helping anybody. Let's go straight at the issue and be bold. So sorry, I just went on the tangent. You hit, you hit no. that button. Herb, That's so, so good. I'm one of our, you did. one of our favorite topics is actually purity and relationships, and just want to encourage the male listener. I want I want to encourage them from the female perspective. If you're listening and you're you're married or you're raising children that are young men or you are single and you're desiring marriage, I would say 
if you are struggling with pornography, get the help you need to prevent yes. the heartache later. Cause your yes. story is being built. Allow that story to become a testimony of not of who you once were or what you participated in or did, but what God has done and how he's redeemed you. Because if, if the trajectory of Gen Z statistically is going to continue to go in this direction of 80 some percent or whatever the percentage is of men struggling 67 last time I looked, whatever it was women struggling with pornography. And this is just looking once or twice a week. This isn't like, like daily stuff. So this is mm -hmm. just the minimum that yep. people are opening things up and participating. And it's saying uh, there's going to be a rise of women who are in ministry, who are, are passionate about Jesus that are going to look around. And I guarantee they will say, where are all the good godly men? Yep. And that is going to, that's going to be a shortage. If the alpha man, even if you're not an alpha male, if a, if a man is not willing to call a generation out in truth yes. and up in love and point them yes. to the heart of Christ in the process, that's where we're going to be coddling the American mind. We're going to be coddling these sinful behaviors. And it's nothing but a recipe for disaster, a disaster when it comes to the kingdom of God, because we want clean right. hands and a pure heart. Like right. that's the types of leaders we want to be. So yep. even if you're a leader listening, you're like, I'm struggling with pornography as a pastor, as a minister ministry leader and oh. the people I'm leading, everything trickles down yeah. into mm -hmm. the people you're leading. I don't care how you don't think it does. It will catch up with you. And you can't give something to somebody that you don't have yourself. Yeah. So if you want to offer them a pure and holy life and point them to Christ and you're not living it yourself, you cannot offer that to somebody if you are living in secret sin. Mm -hmm. And that's where my heart goes out to these women who come to me and they're saying, Micah, we're all the good and godly men. Like, and I'll say, listen, a true man after God's own heart will lead you to the foot of the cross, not yes. the foot of the bed. Mm. Period. Like that's mm. how Go he should that. be living. <laughs> so, and I've I'm written about it that. in the book. That's good. Just like, <laughs> and it's so true. And I think that's a call to the men of saying like, men, we need you. Like we need you to come up against some of these things in this world that it's offering and to show that it can be done. Yeah. Jesus was tempted you probably tempted every single day, but when we can take every thought captive, take it before the Lord, find the people who are like, who've walked through it and are walking strong on the redemption side of it. Because I've worked with so many young women who are like struggling with whatever. It could be pornography. Six girls get together. Okay. We're not going to do X, Y, and Z. So we're all going to hold each other accountable. Okay. None of you are actually going to hold each other accountable because by next week, you've all done something that you shouldn't have done or seen something or looked at something or went with your boyfriend somewhere. And that's not accountability, right? That's not mentorship. That's not discipleship. So yep. know that there are programs out there. There's covenant eyes, which is a software that can be plugged in to any and all platforms. And your purity is worth the $15 a month. Come on, it is one it. coffee, one and a half coffees yeah. from Starbucks anymore. Like it. it is worth it. And I'm glad you brought up Covenant Ice. We'll link it in the show notes. We've always partnered with them on this podcast. If you yep. use the promo code Young right. Adults when you sign up, yep. you get your first month free. And right. man, it'll save you. This is a so good conversation. I'm telling you. you guys. And let me say this too about software and stuff. Like you said, it costs you something, but if it doesn't cost you money, it's going to cost you something else. It's going to cost you your marriage. It's going to cost you your purity. It's going to cost you intimacy with Jesus. Like, so there's a cost either way. You mm -hmm. just have to choose what your cost is. And I, I've had accountability software on my devices since I was like 16. I still have it as a married man. Cause guess what? I have not graduated from lust. <laughs> I have not graduated from the opportunity to go down the wrong path. If we look at pastors and leaders in our world today, mm -hmm. we're not immune. And so yep. we need to make sure that even as leaders, we model what yep. it looks like to call a generation forward. We're not pointing fingers. We're saying, hey, we all need to be above reproach. We all need to walk in the light. We all need to have this kind of transparency. That's what will change in our generation when you say, yo, we're the light of the world. Like, let's live like it. All of us. So shout out to y'all. Shout out to Covenant oh, Eyes. Go good. in the description. Do it. It's worth it. It is worth it. And I'll tell you this, if you give the enemy an inch in any area of your life, he will take a mile every time. It doesn't matter. Not even purity it could be anything yep. under the sun. Do yep. not give the enemy an inch that he'll take a mile and have a field day with you. Let's stop doing the enemy's job for him and start pulling back the territory that God has given us. And part of that thing we can lean into next is one of our favorite parts of our podcast and it's five and five. So are you a baseball fan? Uh, b bare minimum. Bare, bare minimum. minimum. What's your sport? More, basketball, more of a basketball guy, but yeah. Okay, so this would be what's the equivalent to a home three point shootout, but it'll shootout. be five questions, rapid yeah. fire. We'll put five minutes on the clock. You down? Love it. 
All right. The ball's in your court. Question number one. Kick it off, Josiah. Let us in your brain. What are you excited about in 2024 or learning about this year? I'm learning that loving Jesus is the coolest thing you can do. Uh, trying to be cool is overrated. Don't do it. Don't try to be cool. You'll never be cool. Don't try to be trendy. You're never going to be trendy enough. Just authentic love with Jesus is the best and coolest thing you can do. I'm talking to like young leaders out there. If you're trying to lead the next generation, stop trying to be trendy. Stop trying to be cool. Stop trying to build a following. Just love Jesus. Let him take care of the rest. Be yourself. Okay. So here's question number two. What is a fun hobby you enjoy doing maybe outside of your work day, leading young adults? Like what is something we'd find you doing for fun? Let's go pickle ball it is taking over the world the u.s for sure i think it's going to go global soon you want to be in pickleball if you haven't tried pickleball have y'all played pickleball it's a great time. i'm glad you asked i played it i've been dying to play for like four years and <laughs> the first game that i've ever played was last thursday in nashville it was epic Come on. it was epic it's i awful. can't wait to play and take you on soon <laughs> Hey, it's going to be a great time. I think uh, a Minnesota Oklahoma rivalry can be built here. I think it's so great because it's a sport. I love this. Like I'm a I'm an achiever, but I'm also a strategy guy. You know, for the next like 30 years of my life, I can play pickleball. I've played against 80 year olds that beat me. Like inspiring. So this is like my my inspiration now. It's like I'm gonna be 80 years old, whooping up on like 20 year olds. Like that is a goal for me. So uh, it's a great sport. Highly recommend it. There was actually a study done saying that if you play any racquetball score, a racquetball sport, you have 10 to 12 years added onto your life. Yes. Yes. It's so you can live to be 92. <laughs> yes. Come on, somebody. Go do pickleball. Long live pickleball. <laughs> if you could ask Mike and I any question under the sun, what would you want to know? What would you want to learn? What would you want to find out today? You've been doing the podcast for a while now. What would you say? is the most important conversation you've had on the podcast over your time of doing the podcast? Like what, what conversation have you had? That's like, if everyone could listen to this conversation, it may be different answers for both of you, but this is the one you want to have. Cause I'm probably going to go back to this episode and watch it. So. <laughs> Goodness. Okay. I will say one of my favorite topics that we talked is anything, Dr. Alan Tennyson. Ooh. When he's one of our guests, like I know I love George Barna. I love, um, what's his name? Guinness. Like I love like those people too. And I know we can study the stats and statistics, but what I feel the weakest in, um, is having a deep theological understanding and being able to create the tension of like the, the I mean, you, you understand theology, like it's not always yes and no it's yeah. here's what it is and yeah. just sit in it. And I'm yeah. very much like, but what's the answer? And yep. Dr. Tennyson, I think has challenged my thinking and my approach into ministry and leadership and just meditation on the word in awesome. different challenging ways where I'm like, ah, I'm not always going to have an answer. Mm -hmm. I just kind of have to sit in it and wrestle with the tensions mm -hmm. of some of the questions that we come up against. So he has tackled and presented some I don't know, ways of thinking that are so not how I'm wired, mm. uh, but I think would resonate with somebody who's more wired in that regard yeah, and might thinkers. a deep thinker. I'm yeah. very much like prophetic, like what you see is what you get. This is what the Lord's speaking. Can you see it? And I'm like, okay, but time out. Like there's another side that it's hard for me to like understand, not, not understand, but right. not my natural bend. <laughs> well, We'll link that in the show notes to the Dr. Tennyson episodes. I would say there's recently, so there, I mean, there's been so, we're about 275 episodes in. Wow. And so it is really hard to pick a favorite. I would say one that is critical for the future of the church. And we have a unique opportunity is to see that the alpha generation is going to be on the college campus in three falls. And so this year, one of the guests we had on was Dr. Rob Hoskins with One Hope. Ooh, yes. Talked about the Global Youth Report that they're very mm -hmm. research based, mm -hmm. but I feel like that gives you when you can understand the times, you can pray for wisdom from the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit contextually yep. to know what to do. And I think that it's so easy to go to conferences and just get 
like my friend Brent talks about wet puppy syndrome, like the speaker at a conference said something. So yeah. you caught the message and you're all wet and then you go and shake it off at your <laughs> church or your campus and you're all fired up, but everyone else wasn't there. I think we have a unique window of opportunity to minister to, with, and alongside Gen Alpha. Mm-hmm. And so I'll, we'll link that Dr. Rob Hoskins um, episode in the notes too. Well, but- and I'll say with it, our friend Shelby Scott said this, and I just, I'm not in the youth group world or the middle middle school world necessarily. And she goes, if you want to know where Gen Alpha is and how they think and where they're going to be in three, four years, get in front of the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders now to mm-hmm. better understand what your ministry or your campus or your university yep. will probably look like due to just how they function, how they think, how they operate. So yeah, maybe that's a little that's tidbit good. of encouragement for the somebody's listening. That's great. Great advice. All right. So question number four, what is your dream in one sentence? Not hard at all, that's right? A question, Josiah. Way to go. <laughs> mm. He's a deep thinker. He's like a theologian over here. It's okay. <laughs> mm. I'm going to say empowering and equipping the next generation to reach the world. I love it. I feel like we're at home right now. Cause I feel like, Oh, you're one of, we, one of our people, man. This is one of us. <laughs> one of us. Beautiful conversation. <laughs> I love it. No, it's God's going to do some sweet stuff over the next few years. And I think doing it with the next gen, like you said, with alpha, with Gen Z, um, not just two, but through them. Yes. And side note for leaders, getting okay with stepping back and surrendering a microphone, giving a stage, even when you've barely had it. It's not like you've earned it and now you get to be here for the next 20 years. Quick to pass it on, quick to give it up, quick to say, Lord, I don't care about speaking. I don't care about my name or my brand. I care about being a part of what you're doing. So if that means stepping back, if that means stepping forward, stepping to the left, stepping to the right, I just want to be a part of it. And, uh, that's what I, that's what my dream is that every young adult, every youth pastor, every leader would be like, I don't care about being the next it or name or brand or conference. I just want to be a part of what God's doing. Good. I love it. It's an honor to be a small part of what he's doing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Amen. It's an honor. Hey, last question. Five of five. If you could leave the listener with one piece of encouragement, insight, perspective, or advice, what would you want to share with them today? I think humility is a game changer and in our world that vies for a voice for attention to be seen, to be heard. Jesus offers a different way, which is the way of humility. Um, Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And so I wrestle with this all the time because like many people, I have social media platforms. I have opportunities. I could be on awesome podcasts with awesome people So instead of trying to build a voice, build a brand, build your leadership, be seen, get the invite to that thing or that thing, choose the way of humility and just embrace the season God has you in. Um, Some of the craziest, coolest people we've seen in history that have made the biggest impact for the kingdom didn't set out to be the biggest, the best, the largest. I think about a Billy Graham and it's like he didn't set out saying, I want to preach to this many people in my life. He said, I just want people to experience Jesus. I want them to be saved. I want to see our country turn around, our world turn around. So Jesus, whatever you want me to do, if that's preaching, I'll do it. If that's going, I'll go. If that's saying yes, I'm going to say yes. And so my advice to everyone is uh, choose the way of Jesus. Uh, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Amen. I'm challenged mm-hmm. by that because, you know, I forget who I heard say this recently, but saying no takes more faith than saying yes does. 100%. And sometimes God asks us to say no and humbly submit to him. And then where that faith and trust and rubber meets the road is, okay, God, if I say no to this, it's trusting that your word will go forward and you still Mm -hmm. have a plan and a path and a pattern to use me however you see fit. But I'm learning in 2024, it it deeply resonates that um, for me at least, man, saying no takes a lot more faith than saying yes. Yeah, I can feel that. Amen. Well, we're so grateful for you. Thank you for joining the Young Adults Today podcast. 
Thank you guys for having me. Delightful conversation and uh, super thankful to be a part of what you guys are doing. Amazing. And you can check out Covenant Eyes by using the password or the code word young adults to get your free one month subscription, hopefully started. And then you could also check out the two podcasts that Josiah and I recommended for you to listen to as leaders.